Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezak, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. Tonight's program is part of the 2020 One Book, One Chicago season, exploring the theme Beyond Borders and the book Exit West by Mohsin Hamid. For more information on other virtual programs, including book discussions, author events, workshops, and more, visit onebookonechicago.org. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by CPL's Polish American Heritage Committee and presented in honor of Polish American Heritage Month. My thanks to them for making tonight's program possible. Thanks also to the Chicago Public Library Foundation, Bank of America, Union Pacific, and United Airlines for their support in making this season of One Book, One Chicago possible. During tonight's program, we'll be monitoring the chat for questions from the audience for our Q&A following the talk, so please feel free to ask one anytime during the program, and we'll get to them at the end. Tonight, we're pleased to present Overlooked Landmarks of Polish Chicago with Daniel Pogoszelski. Daniel Pogoszelski is devoted to promoting Chicago's rich legacy of ethnic communities, history, and architecture as a writer and editor for Forgotten Chicago. Daniel has co-authored four history books to date and has appeared on film and television discussing the history of Chicago and Polish and Americans. In addition to serving as vice president of the Northwest Chicago Historical Society, Daniel has been involved in a number of community initiatives on his native Northwest side, such as the installation of historic kiosks at Six Corners, the Bureaus and Community Garden at Addison and Avondale, and working with the Polish Triangle Coalition. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Daniel to the CPL virtual stage. Welcome, Daniel. also like to thank the uh, Polish Heritage Committee at the Chicago Public Library for having me. It's an honor and I have to say, uh, maybe speechless, hopefully won't be speechless during this talk, um, <laughs> uh, but might as well get on with the show. So the first image that we see here is a neighborhood parade at Central Park and Milwaukee Avenue taking place in the late 70s and these girls who are carrying a banner from the Square Neighborhood Association dress in Polish native dress. Uh, I thought this would be a good way to, number one, talk about the profound influence that Poles have who've been here in this city since before it was officially incorporated. Now, because of the volume of how many Polish items, how much Polish history is here, it's very difficult to actually have all of it. So a presentation like this is more fitting for a class as opposed to a presentation. So by virtue of that, I'm going to overlook things, even though we're trying to not overlook anything. Uh, so with that, let's get on with the show. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Not many folks would anticipate that you'd begin such a presentation with such a recognizable landmark like the Tribune Tower, which is at 435 North Michigan. Um, yet, yes, we will go there. And if we'll go to the next slide, the reason for that is that there is a notable collection all over the Tribune Tower, which was completed in 1925 in a neo-Gothic design where Colonel McCormick famously installed uh, a tens of stones from all over the world. At this point, it's nearly 150 since after the decades of his death, it's been added on to. But we'll ask you to go to the next slide. And as viewers will see, right there in the side, the left side of the doorway at 435 North Michigan is none other than a fragment of the Royal Castle in Krakow, Poland, the Wawel Castle, one of the most recognizable landmarks from which the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was ruled. The collection that Colonel McCormick had began during the time of World War I and later was added onto by correspondence. Now, uh, there's some dispute as to whether these were legitimate possessions. Colonel McCormick said they were gifts. Historical records say maybe not completely, but nonetheless, what a beautiful testament that in this pearl in Chicago city center that we have this visual uh, connection which greets everybody who comes in to the Tribune Tower. So we'll go on to the next slide. And Chicago is interesting. So we talked about the city center downtown. Uh, Chicago is unique because 
you'll find different ethnic enclaves in, in other cities where you'll find Pole Town in Detroit. You'll hear of Little Poland, Little Warsaw, Polish village in many other cities. Yet Chicago is unique in that it had a Polish downtown, a Polish capital. Now that would not be overlooked. And especially when you see this eye-catching edifice, which is on Division Street, just east of Milwaukee at the Triangle, an Art Deco gem that was designed by the firm of Slipkowski and Piontek. Now, when we go on to the next slide, having taken in its beautiful angles, um, when I say that this building had a connection not only to Chicago's history, not only to the Polish community here, it had a international connection through that Polish community worldwide. One of the presidents of the Polish National Alliance and the founder of the Polish American Congress is seen here on this photo, Karl Rosmarek, who was originally from Buffalo and then because of the fact that he assumed this leadership position, moved to Chicago, um, is here in this view from the Oval Office during World War II with a map of interwar Poland right there. So let's go to the next slide. However, the history making of this building is not only shown here in this lovely plaque that shows that it received landmark status. That landmark status was because of its current tenant who is historic in her own right. That would be Jeannie Gang, who designed not only Chicago's Aqua Tower, but buildings all over the world, including the next slide, which we'll show right now. This is a design, she was a finalist for the uh, Presidential Library honoring Theodore Roosevelt that will be in Medora, South Dakota. So she's one of three finalists. I, as a patriotic Chicagoan, am rooting for her. But it goes to show you how some of these landmarks, after their life, will have a new life, which is part of what Chicago is. It's a city of neighborhoods where all of these different ethnicities come together and create an interesting symphony. So let's go to the next slide. Now, as somebody that's involved with Forgotten Chicago, I should describe a little bit about our organization. So for ForgottenChicago.com, uh, it's a, a collective of some folks who are very interested and passionate about overlooked aspects of Chicago's built environment. Now, part of that is because we have a passion for trying to save these stories, because if we don't promote them, they themselves won't exist. They'll die, they'll cease to exist. And so we also enjoy trying to dig up pearls. Here I have to be grateful. There's a, a book here on the right where it says, Sienka Pamiątkowa, Domu dla Wyszeleńców Polskich. And it has the date, which dates from the end of the 1940s. Now, what's interesting here is that I came across this because of a friend named Mark Dobrzycki, who brought this book to me, mysterious as it was, and let's go to the next page. It was a scrapbook of sorts, and here it talks about how on Sunday they will be christening a home for displaced persons from Poland. What's interesting is that I couldn't find any sort of notes, any recognition about this, but we've been able to dig up some interesting nuggets, including the fact that this home that you see here um, was in the Irving Park neighborhood. It has the exact address. And taking into account what these refugees went through, I think is something that's uh, even more interesting because of the fact that these are people who began their story in Chicago in this structure after having gone through a horrendous history. Let's take into account that the population of Poland before World War II was about 38 million and that in 1945, I believe it was 26 million, so that's 12 million people who were killed, and those that survived had uh, horrific memories that they carried with them. And so it was in this particular space that they found a new life. And let's go to the next slide. Here's a cartoon that you'll see, and in the next slide, the cartoon, we'll just wait for it to pop up here. Here it is. So you have where the building's in the background, uh, the female figure on the left, uh, almost looking angelic, is Chicago's Polish community. And in a traditional Polish style, she is giving 
water, uh, I'm sorry, bread and salt, which is a traditional folk reading, uh, to a person on the right who curiously, although he's identified as displaced persons from Poland, to me has a curious resemblance to Abraham Lincoln. I don't know if this is uh, some kind of homage or maybe it's just a coincidence, but I really think that he looks like Honest Abe. And so in this fashion we had where this folks were welcomed and later helped build the city after World War II and it became its fabric. So we'll go on to the next slide. I was very worried that this building would have been demolished, but as we see here, thanks to Google Maps, it's there, uh, pretty much intact. And when I talk about the perils of potential demolition, the building that's just to the south of this, so this building is at 42, 46 North Kedvale, which is in the old Irving Park neighborhood of Chicago. The beautiful brick building that's just to the left of it at 4242 North Kedvale has already been approved for demolition. On its site, it has a large lot. You will see that it will be a multi-unit building, which is profitable. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Chicago is a unfortunately a city where, um, to paraphrase a well-known quote, we do at times squander our architectural legacy. It's a city that's known for its architecture, and yet we don't always, unfortunately, fulfill, I believe, our responsibilities to that. Case to point is the Wachowski Ray House, which was at the northeast corner of Long and Lawrence, a beautiful historic structure, which was the home for both uh, Valentine Wachowski, as well as Olaf Ray, two movers and shakers from two different ethnicities. Mr. Wachowski was involved with the Polish community. In fact, the, po uh, the Polish Roman Catholic parish of St. Constance had its first mass at Mr. Wachowski's home. Later, Olaf Ray, who in a similar fashion brought together Chicago's Scandinavian community, as well as Scandinavians back in the old world, uh, who also was someone who had both political influence and had a very dynamic personality trying to get things done. Uh, this home was literally torn down late last year, and we'll go to the next slide. So this is just a little bit of the interior. I wish I had better shots, but from what I had heard, um, it was a, a building which the interior, as lushly decorated as they were, really would have been fit for the Gold Coast. And we can spy here some wonderful stained glass windows. And we'll go to the next slide. Here it is being demolished. And we'll go to the next slide for a different view of it. And you see the large, spacious uh, lot, which unfortunately, because of the fact that it didn't have any landmark protections, uh, we ourselves actually, with the Northwest Chicago Historical Society, had written an article. I'd like to thank Frank Seworth and Susanna Ernst, who did the research on it, and it was a great piece. I personally suspect that the reason the developer had demolished it so quickly after he was able to do so was because of the fact that they were worried about a neighborhood backlash, and so unfortunately, it was demolished. Let's go to the next slide. Now, thankfully, this building that I'm showing you, which was which is located at 2222 North Kedzie, was the building for the Chicago Society of the Polish National Alliance. Uh, the Chicago Society actually sold it. It was in its last incarnation, uh, actually a daycare center. And we'll go to the next slide. Uh, given Logan Square status as an ethnic Gold Coast, it had Chicago's well-to-do Polonia, the term for the Polish diaspora. And case in point, I always like this room right here, the Polynesian room after World War II when returning American soldiers came back. Uh, many of them had been stationed in the Pacific and so we have the emergence of tiki culture. And uh, this little uh, bar that was in the clubhouse uh, appointed in a fashion reminiscent of this. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist right now, but we do have these cool photos. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And here we see a totally different geography. We're going from the Pacific all the way to the Carpathian foothills. So in the Carpathian mountains, you have uh, spanning from Transylvania, 
heading all the way north and west, uh, all the way into uh, Bratislava and even close to Vienna. You have where shepherds, Wallachians, who had originally come from Romania, who as refugees from the Ottoman Empire, influenced the cultures of the highlands of the Carpathian Mountains and brought with them very ancient techniques where homes would be built without any nails used for them. Let's remember metal was very hard to come by. It was a harsh climate and often challenging economic circumstances. And so at 4808 North Archer, we have where the Polish Highlander community, and I'll, we'll all remember Dominic Pasiga, who when you're talking about Chicago history, is one of the top experts. I mean, the guy even had, was a visiting scholar at Oxford in Campion Hall. So you have to give him kudos for that. He himself is a Polish Highlander and he's very aware and has been to the Polish Highlander, Alli uh, Polish Highlander Alliance of North America many times, or what it's also called, the Polish Highlander home. And this cultural center, we'll go to the next slide, uh, has where it's not only a community center, but to make money, also has a banquet hall and a restaurant. Um, the restaurant's open, the bar is closed, um, uh, and of course there are restrictions for, for because of COVID, but we'll see here appointed in a manner which is reminiscent of the Carpathian Mountains. But let's go to the next slide, and we'll see here that the large Carpathian community that the Polish Gurals, as they're called, the Polish Highlanders, has brought some of these art traditions which go back far before Christianity. One of the, the interesting things that we see here is what's called a spinka guralska, uh, a brooch which is very similar to fibulae that you'll find at, from the times of the Roman Empire. And yet for some curious reason, in the Tatra Mountains we have where these interesting brooches have survived. And someone created a larger version. Of course, in Chicago, we make everything bigger. We supersize everything. And so somebody decided to employ this traditional craft and put it on his post box. And check out the next slide. Uh, here you have where in the neighborhood of Belmont Cragen, this is about a block away from St. Ferdinand's Parish, which today, even though that was started as a territorial parish, is one of the largest and more prominent Polish Roman Catholic parishes here in Chicago, somebody decided on their two flat to design an awning in a Carpathian style. In this case, reminiscent of the Zakopane style of architecture, which was created, synthesized from those traditions by Stanisław Witkiewicz. We'll go to the next slide. And here we see where you'll see a number of these, and I'm hopeful that people that are watching today will have their eyes peeled and take a look at these, where in that Zakopane style of architecture, we see chapels. Oftentimes they'll have uh, figurines to Our Lady of Lujmiesz, which is a, a Marian shrine that is very popular amongst Chicago's Polish Highlander community. And here we have where there's two chapels, one of them that's in the style of architecture that's popular in Zakopane, and to the right of it, a country, uh, in this case, not made out of wood, in a stone brick edifice that's also very popular in the Carpathian Mountains. So let's go to the next slide. Now, what does it mean to have Polish art? Here we have an image from the, Car uh, from the Paschke Art Center. Now, Ed Paschke, a very prominent artist, was also a proud Polish American. And here I have to give kudos to my father because of the fact that thanks to him, I actually got to meet Ed Paschke as a young child when he received a Lifetime Achievement Award for, um, for being a prominent Polish American artist. In these photos that you'll see up here, uh, I'm a person who not only enjoys talking to Polish Americans, but likes to, in a sense, proselytize about Chicago. And this here is Andrzej Klipa, who is a professor from the Czech Republic, speaks great Polish, who I took to go and visit the Paschke Art Center. So let's go to the next image. Uh, here we have some other uh, international guests that I was showing around here in Chicago. We'll go to the next slide. Here is part of the Art Center where they have a replica, a recreation, I shouldn't say a replica, recreation of Ed Paschke's studio 
that was on Howard Street. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Here's another view of that. And Ed Paschke is somebody who was the first American artist uh, who actually had his artwork shown in the Centre Pompidou in Paris while he was still alive. Let's go to the next slide. And for that reason, we have where there's an honorary street for Ed Paschke. Now this is after there's an honorary street de designation, the family and the families involved with running the Paschke Art Center uh, were given this sign, which they put in the Art Center. But if we go to the next slide, we'll see where it's actually at. This is in front of the Art Institute, perpendicular to Michigan Avenue. And so you can't get more prominent digs with that. And it goes to show you how uh, poles have really been a part of the city. Let's go to the next slide. Here you have where a Polish-American artist by the name of Jerzy Rogowski created this wonderful mural just a few years ago entitled Tree of Life. Uh, in front of it is a, a Polish musical journalist who was very captivated by this particular mural and thought that it had a sort of punk rock aesthetic, which I could definitely see. Let's go to the next slide. Here you have a wonderful mural that I love in particular, not only because it was mentioned by the Getty uh, Museum as a, uh, an outdoor mural, which is reflective of Polish culture here in Chicago, but because of the fact that in my estimation, it is a combination of Polish traditions, right? We see the folk outfits who, and the people in different styles, but also since it was created in 1975, 1976 for the US Bicentennial, also with regards to American folklore, in this case, as I see it, hip hop, the aesthetic of its time. So it was created by Carol Yasko, let's go to the next slide, who she has a Polish last name because of her husband, but she herself is of Norwegian and English descent, if I remember correctly. This is a photo that the artist had from its painting. Let's go to the next slide. Here is it completed, beautiful colors. Um, as you can see here, let's go to the next slide. But let's remember that here in Chicago, uh, these are projects which have people that are reflective of the diversity of our city. Uh, by the way, one of the things that I always really appreciated in this photo, uh, Carol, by the way, is the second to the left that you'll see there, uh, woman with a bandana. But just to the left of her is uh, the woman that has those really, uh, <laughs> really stylish uh, high heels, bell bottoms, and the camera. So I'm hopeful that maybe that's still out there somewhere. And I'd love to see uh, something that was filmed from that, but still have to dig more for that. Let's go forward with the next slide. Um, unfortunately, this mural is on borrowed time. And I'm hopeful that maybe some of the folks that are watching it will try to maybe somehow motivated to save it because uh, in between the fact that it's been in uh, sorry shape and dilapidated with the trees that have been planted in front of it, um, that even further damages it. So uh, it's a beautiful landmark and overlooked and I'm hopeful that maybe it'll get some TLC in the future. Now let's go to the next slide. Now when we talk about these murals, I think it's also to kind of further the point that I made earlier, um, Tony Passero was uh, an artist who was a very successful advertising executive who later wanted to express himself in a community fashion and has gone about painting murals all over the world, but especially here in Chicago where he used to live um, for free, uh, lining up sponsors and trying to uh, enliven Chicago, which I'm very grateful to him for. Actually, the mural that inspired him was the Raza mural, uh, which also influenced his style in his own estimation. Now, Tony created this mural right here, which is called Crosscuts. And it's a mural which to anyone who's Polish will instantly be recognizable because of its shapes, which uh, draw from the traditions of Polish paper and Tony to incorporate the Latino traditions of papel picado, which is very popular in the Spanish speaking world the arts of paper cuts, and the Polish and Slavic art of Vichinanki uh, brought together this piece. And so Tony, his, his wife is Polish, uh, but you had once again a multi-ethnic crew on here. So it goes to show you with regards to our 
uh, specific brand of Polishness in Chicago. Let's go to the next slide. Um, one of the interesting things that I came across in trying to find images was that, uh, sure, this might be an overlooked Polish landmark, but for people that are, are trying to peddle their wares, uh, in this case, it, this is an advertisement for handbags, you have where very clearly the background is Tony's mural. So uh, that's, some, that's something positive I thought that would be enjoyable for everyone. Let's go to the next slide. Um, when we're talking about vernacular art, here you have uh, a, a, ver, a, uh, <laughs> a uh, art initiative that is extremely vernacular, where someone decided in front of their humble park home to, on their fence, bring together the traditions of both Warsaw, our first sister city in Chicago, and the Chicago Star. Uh, the mermaid, the siren of Warsaw, is something that folks all over in Poland will instantly uh, think of with Poland and Warsaw. And uh, what a beautiful way to try to bring together that relationship. Let's go to the next slide. And to further highlight that, uh, here you see where uh, there's two footprints, one with the Polish flag and one with the American flag. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so talking about Chicago and it's interesting way of just manifesting everywhere with regards to its Polishness. This is a mural that was created by Northeastern students on Diversity Avenue, uh, just off the Kennedy exit on the north side of the viaduct. And there's a very well-known painting by Frida Kahlo. It's called The Two Fridas, which talks about the different ways in which Frida Kahlo saw herself, right? There's a duality in all of us. And yet only here in Chicago do you have, we're riffing off of this painting, and the fringes of where Logan Square and Avondale come together, uh, going on the motif of where Eastern Europe and Latin America meet, you have where Frida Kahlo is depicted in a Mexican folk costume, as well as a Polish folk costume. And what a wonderful way to talk about how unique Chicago is and the ways that these intercultural dialogues manifest themselves in very creative ways. Next slide. Now, few people would ever say that St. John Cantius is an overlooked part of the city of Chicago, uh, but it's a well-known capital for sacred art, and in 2016, actually was chosen on an online poll as the most beautiful church in America. Next slide. It's hard to wonder why, especially when you see here this wonderful crest, which also is the seal for the Polish National Alliance, and draws from the symbol for one of the insurrections in which Poles mounted one of their unsuccessful bids for independence in the 1900s. And underneath it, with the phrase in Polish, Bożesław Polskę, God save Poland. Next slide. And yet even here, often overlooked, is a beautiful side chapel. Now, the altarpiece that we see here is a one-third size replica of the magnificent high Gothic altar by Wait Stoss, who's known in Polish as Wait Stwosz. It was only created in 1994 by a Polish Highlander folk artist by the name of Michał Batkiewicz. Begun in 1994, it took him nine years to carve this all by hand. It was in different areas of the church when finally it was brought and put together in a chapel that's underneath one of the towers. And here, with the background painted in a style reminiscent of the Marian Basilica in Krakow, just off of the main town square in Krakow, we have this wonderful, beautiful connection. By the way, this chapel was so prized that during World War II, after the German Nazis occupied Krakow, it was looted, and thankfully for us, it was recovered after World War II. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, more overlooked is the old cathedral of All Saints, the former cathedral of All Saints of the Polish National Catholic Church, a, move, a religious movement which actually began here. Now, it's interesting because Polish church architecture in the United States is called, by, among other designations, as the Polish cathedral style of architecture. Yet, for the most part, none of them are cathedrals. Uh, it just seems to have arisen from the human impulse since Polish immigrants put so much 
TLC, so much love and care and money behind these impressive edifices that the average Joe just wanting to express that it was more than just an average church called them cathedrals. And so whether you're in Pittsburgh, Chicopee, Massachusetts, St. Louis, Buffalo, or Chicago, you'll find these edifices which are all over. This here is a true Polish cathedral though, because it actually is a former cathedral. Let's go to the next slide. Now here you have an image here in black and white that just goes to show you how stately and beautifully appointed this interior was with angels all over. And thankfully, if we'll go to the next slide, it was sold in 1994 and is now Covenant Presbyterian Church. And much of it has been preserved, including the beautiful paintings that you'll actually see here. Um, along the walls, there are actually angels who have on them coats of arms of cities of interwar Poland. And interestingly enough, two of Poland's most prominent poets are titled Wieszczowie, which I would translate as a poet prophet because of the almost religious significance of their patriotic works. These are Adam Mickiewicz and Julius Słowacki. And to my knowledge, the only church that I've ever seen stained glass windows depicting these two poet prophets are here in this church above the choir. Let's go to the next slide. Now, St. Hyacinth Basilica, also not an edifice that's overlooked. It's one of the three basilicas in Chicago and the one with roots in having been built by the Polish community. We'll go to the next slide. That beautiful building by Werthmann and Steinbach is very well noted. And no surprise that no less a Polish celebrity, a Polish uh, very famous distinguished Pole who visited the United States, Pope John Paul II himself visited it. And when church groups actually visited him from that parish, he recounted, I was with there, with you there at St. Hyacinth. We'll go on to the next slide. But here you have in the Garden of Memory certainly is overlooked, particularly this monument dedicated to the Blue Army or Holler's Army. This was a unique effort whereby Poles from all over the United States went to go fight where after over 120 years of Poles not having an independent state, people volunteered and they came out. And because there was a standing army, when everything was over at the end of World War II, the Polish army among the ruins of the German, Austro-Hungarian and former Russian empires was able to secure an independent country. This monument celebrates almost 500, 499 young men who all served in World War I, as well as those that died. And the leader of that army, General Haller himself, came in 1923 to dedicate it. So when folks talk about Chicago and its role, I would argue that when people say that there would not be a possibility for Poland to have regained its independence um, after having had so many setbacks, that it's accurate to say that with the Chicago's role, because people will say, sure, without the United States, with Chicago as the cultural capital for the United States Polish community, that effort would not have been successful without Chicago's impact. Let's go to the next slide. Now, St. Hyacinth is also tied in to other structures that are in the vicinity. I've always loved the beautiful Byzantine Romanesque stylings uh, with a definite Art Deco flavor that you see in St. Wenceslas Parish, which was originally a mission church, uh, parishioners who decided to strike out on their own um, from St. Hyacinth Church. And so uh, something that I definitely encourage folks to take a look at as they approach the Addison exit on the Kennedy Expressway where you can get a great view of it. Let's go to the next slide. Here we have a bas-relief that is off St. Francis Xavier Church. Now St. Francis Xavier was founded by German immigrants. In fact one of the interesting things is the only church in Chicago that was actually uh, built by the son of a rabbi. However by the 1920s this parish had become Polish American. And what an interesting coming to full circle because when Poles first started to settle in Avondale before they had their own church, they came to this church, St. Francis Xavier, which by the way, after merging today is now called 
Resurrection Holy Catholic Church. And until 1936, the church it was on was fittingly called Resurrection Catholic Church. And this bas relief that we're looking at, well, in the 1930s, the parishioners hired Władysław Gawlinski, who was from Lvov originally, which is today Lviv in Western Ukraine, uh, to do a series of ba beautiful bas reliefs adorning the church, uh, which honor St. Francis Xavier. Let's go to the next slide. Here we have a wonderful view of Milwaukee and Pulaski and the Milford Theater, uh, a beautiful theater which was actually originally for the Asher Brothers Circuit. It had both a theater itself as well as a social hall that was part of it. So it was a large complex. Let's go to the next slide. It was known as the Cinema Polski before the Copernicus Center was purchased and opened in the former Gateway Theater. This was where so many of Chicago's uh, Polish community events, film productions, and concerts all happened. If any of you got to see the film with Angelina Jolie titled Salt, uh, this gentleman right here, Daniel Orbiski, who's pictured here in front of a poster at the uh, Milford Theater, uh, actually starred in that film. He played the Russian agent who was the mastermind behind uh, the bringing of Soviet slash Russian agents as young children uh, to uh, disrupt the United States. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And here we have the Polish equivalent to Jim Morrison, as some would say, Czesław Niemen, who by, if you're interested, actually did a number of interesting numbers in English. So it's a way for you to try to connect with that very famous Polish artist. Let's go for, forward. Here we have Maryla Rodowicz, also in the former Cinema Polski, the Milford Theater, also when she was performing a concert. Let's go past into the next slide. Now, aside from arts and culture, literally a block away um, on Pulaski Avenue, just south of the intersection of Milwaukee and Pulaski, that small nondescript building that we see here, that was the SPK building, short for Stowarzyszenie Polski Kombatantu, the Polish Combatants Association. It was part of an organization that was formed in, in the 1950s by folks from Poland who fought for a free and independent Poland and could not return back to their homeland as when these people did return to Poland, they would be executed by the Soviets who did not leave Poland until the 1990s. However, this building was not just important for that organization. You had a whole host of other organizations that also called it home. Let's go to the next slide. Here we have where a affiliate, a satellite of the Polish University Abroad, which is based in London, had a Chicago satellite um, educational institution inside this building. Aside from it, the very well-known Polish anti-communist organization, which even had the support of President Ronald Reagan called Pomost, which is Polish for footbridge, also met in this building. And you had people of many different roles, including Leopold Tidmant, who was a very famous writer, who came to these meetings, as well as just local Poles in Chicago that really wanted to make an impact to try to um, overthrow the communist regime in Poland. We'll go to the next slide. Now, when you're talking about beautiful symbols of the Polish village in Chicago, this is perhaps the one that's closest to my heart. On top of this, you see Jackowo, which is the Polish word for the St. Hyacinth. Uh, probably the best way to translate it would be like Hyacinthville, because the cultural center for that neighborhood was St. Hyacinth Basilica. And in the late 70s, early 80s, we saw where 64 of these signs between Diversity Avenue all the way to Addison Street were put in with the different crests of Polish capital cities. At the time, there was 49 different voivodeships in Poland that were all put, to, put forward along Milwaukee Avenue. Let's go to the next slide. As you can see here, probably one of the best birthday gifts that I ever received was actually uh, one of these signs. Uh, a friend of mine said, the one caveat is that when I give this to you, you can't ask me how I got this, so I won't ask any questions. But 
uh, here you have where I'm giving a history talk about the history of Avondale here um, with the Avondale Neighborhood Association and trying to talk about the overlooked um, overlooked things that are in our neighborhood, which some people might remember, uh, but to me were very inspiring and maybe someday they'll bring them back. Let's go to the next slide. Those signs were replaced with uh, the more generic brown signs that you saw implemented all over the city. But if you ask me, it just doesn't have the same kind of charm or intimate connection with uh, Polish culture as these did. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so here you see here where, once again, we have Jackskovo, but instead of having a Polish crest, we have the crest of, that's stylized on the American flag with the letters USA at Milwaukee and Central Park. But aside from this, we also have the very noted neon sign of the Orbit restaurant. I myself have a connection because my mom actually for a time was even a waitress there. The owner, Ted Kowalczyk, was called the unofficial mayor of Avondale in the Polish village. And to further highlight that point, let's go to the next slide. Um, this, by the way, is the original St. Hyacinth Church, which was actually originally at this site as an interesting aside. Um, it was moved from the intersection where that wonderful building uh, was later constructed because according to Jubilee books, the pitter patter of horse-drawn streetcars were just too distracting during mass and prayer. Let's go to the next slide. Here you have the mayor of Avondale, Tadeusz Kowalczyk, um, kissing his wife, Violetta Vilas. She was the equivalent of Brigitte Bardot, a famous sex symbol of Poland in the 1960s that was known for her long glowing locks that you see right here. And so, uh, you could say this was the epitome of Mr. Kowalczyk's American dream. Uh, the person who had, by the way, um, where not only was it a place where Chicago's elites came in, but no less, according to testimony given by Ward Miller during proceedings to protect the Orbit building after the restaurant closed, had no less a person than Bill Clinton actually come in there to, set, uh, to both taste it's wonderful food, as well as to say, I care about the Polish community because I love Polish food, which is a political tradition that you see of that is uh, multi-partisan in Chicago. We'll go to the next slide. So here is the Orbit building. Now, unfortunately, a good portion of the building that we see right here, and we see in, in larger detail all the way to the right, the neon sign that we saw that's at the intersection of that was at intersection of Central Park and Milwaukee Avenue, but a substantial part of this building was demolished for a parking lot as well as a bank drive through Now we were very lucky here because that was a compromise. The original plan had to have it replaced with a whole mess of parking lot and pavement, and this whole building would have been demolished, including the wonderful terracotta elements that decorate it as they do many other Chicago buildings. And so this brings an end to my presentation. Um, and I'm hopeful that if there's any message that folks take from it is number one, keep your eyes peeled because you'll find interesting cultural anecdotes and ties to the whole world here in Chicago. And also that they're worth protecting and that that won't happen unless you get involved. And so take this as your call to arms and let's not squander our architectural legacy. Thank you. Wise words, Daniel. Very wise words. Thank you so much. <laughs> we do have some great questions from the audience. Uh, somebody asks, uh, just how does one parcel out a piece of a castle? That's a great question. Uh, I would imagine <laughs> that if you were to ask uh, Colonel McCormick, he would say, oh, well, of course, because I am just somebody of such great caliber. By the way, Colonel McCormick was somebody that was well known for having a healthy appreciation of himself. We'll put it very diplomatically there. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, if you were to go in the foyer, and I loved showing this to, to folks that were from overseas, uh, the foyer of the Tribune Tower, you would see greats like Euripides, 
such as the founding fathers, such as Unius, who all had one quote each. The only figure that had two quotes when you're talking about the greats of classical civilization and the United States was only Colonel McCormick. So <laughs> it just goes to show you, um, I guess, what happens in situations like those. <laughs> That's great. Um, you talked a little bit about how the Polish Christian displaced persons came and influenced part of the, the story here in Chicago. And someone asked, do you know how many of them arrived in Chicago by the early 1950s? Sure. So if I remember correctly, you had beginning with 1939, when the war begins, all the way into the 1950s. So what's important here is that you had Poles that were of different religions. Of course, you had many Polish Catholics, but aside from that, you had Poles that were also Orthodox. So of course, the largest group of Poles comes from, uh, follows the Roman Catholic tradition, but you had people that were also um, Orthodox. You had people that also were Jewish. And even interestingly enough, there was also, people might not know this, there was a small tar Lipka Tartar minority in Poland, and some of those folks also emigrated to the United States. Now, of course, those are much smaller groups, but it's estimated that at the very least, we had uh, well over 100,000 that arrived in between the time that World War II began to the demobilization of the last displaced person camps in the 1950s. And this was part of a wave which not only were Poles part of it, but you also had people that were from other countries, such as Lithuania, Latvia, Ukraine, and Belarus. And so, for example, you had people that were not from interwar Poland, that were ethnically Polish, who actually came from Lithuania, for example. And so, mm -hmm. as is the complicated history of Eastern Europe, you had a whole mess of people that thankfully came to Chicago, which said, welcome. That's great. That is a true Chicago story, right? So, so many people welcome from everywhere. Um, someone asked, where are most of these murals that you talked about located? Or are well, they kind of uh, all over? <laughs> sure. Well, so there's a number of them. So the Raza mural is uh, just west of Pulaski on Belmont Avenue. And if one were to pass by the McDonald's to just go by local landmarks, it's, there's no uh, <laughs> there's no sponsorship here. But just past the, the McDonald's to in their parking lot, uh, one will see the Raza mural. That's the mural that I had mentioned by Carol Yasko that was done in 1976. With regards to the, uh, the Crosscuts mural, that is on Addison, which is um, at Addison, just off the Kennedy Expressway on the north side of the underpass there at Addison and Avondale, where those two streets intersect. Uh, with regards to the, uh, let's see, the other murals, I'm trying to think, crosscuts. I'm missing one, but for some reason, I'm having a blip in my brain and I, I can't. You know what? Let's put, we can put it in the comments afterwards. We can add it to the YouTube comments. Yeah, I'll be happy to help <laughs> identify it. That would be great. And people could go on their own little tour, right? Um, Nikki asks, my fourth grader is learning about cultural migration in Chicago. He's interested in our Polish heritage. Where can we start learning? Well, the first person would be, and I'm sure you'll agree with me here, Dominic Pesiga, who wrote an excellent book that's called uh, uh, American Warsaw. It's a history which talks about the ties between Poland and the United States through Chicago. And so it's a great place to start. Dominic's written a number of other wonderful books that are about that. I'll also probably bring up Joe Jarofsky, who's written a wonderful book on Chicago, the history of Polish Chicago, along with tasty recipes in it. So uh, <laughs> a twofer, one could say, that will deliciously whet your appetite for learning about Poland. And absolutely, both of those books are available at the Chicago Public Library. So also, Nikki, a great thing is to go to the children's library and, and have your son, your fourth grader, ask um, them about what they would recommend and they can help him out as well. Um, Al asks, what is the Polish National Catholic Church uh, that you referred to? Sure. So what you had is that in the United States, especially new immigrant groups would oftentimes uh, have uh, face discrimination. And so... Uh, when Polish Catholics came to the United States, um, groups that had arrived earlier who had sort of staked out this theological territory 
of uh, you had where there were co ethnic conflicts. And in this case, a sizable Polish community felt that it was not given its due its uh, represent with regards to representation and resources from the Roman Catholic Church. And so you had a movement all over the United States where Poles uh, separated from the Catholic Church and created the Polish National Catholic Church. Interestingly enough, it's actually headquartered in Scranton, Pennsylvania. That's where the home of Vice President Joe Biden, where he was originally from, as well as Dunder Mifflin. So for all those folks who liked <laughs> watching John Krasinski, a Polish-American actor who was on The Office, uh, it was located in Scranton. And so, uh, sure, we Chicagoans, there's strong Polish here, but let's remember that all over the Great Lakes and Middle Atlantic regions, there is a very strong Polish Central and Eastern European presence. That's great. Um, someone asks if, why is it that the, what, what is the landmark that no longer exists that you personally would want to see if you could go back in time? Oh boy. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I answered this question inevitably will be like answering what's your favorite Beatles song. I can tell you what's my favorite <laughs> right now, but there's no way that you can say it's your favorite <laughs> of all time. So uh, a wonderfully appointed building was Pulaski Hall. Um, the only remnant that I'm aware of of Pulaski Hall is that it's wonderfully adorned a bust of Kazmierz Pulaski uh, actually is in the garden of the Polish Highlanders Alliance. Aside from that, uh, beautifully decorated in terracotta. Uh, I've seen photos of the exterior, not many from the inside of it, but from my understanding of it is that it was just uh, eye candy. There's a lot of buildings we would like to travel back in time, right? And see if we could. Um, somebody asks, what, was there any notable monuments to Pope John Paul's visit to Chicago, such as the Quigley High School site? Uh, so are there monuments to him? So for example, in the Garden of Memory that uh, I had pointed out earlier, you have next to the monument to Holler's army, there is a large monument to Pope John Paul II that's there. And underneath it, it has the phrase, Pamiętam jak byłem u was na Jackowie, which means I remember when I was there with you. And in Polish, it has the unique way of being a twofer because it means both in the basilica as well as the name for the neighborhood. So kind of, it's a little ambiguous there, but in a way that's just kind of heartwarming. Um, aside that's from that, funny. on the basilica, yeah. Aside from that, on the basilica, there's monumental bronze doors that are done by the same sculptor who actually, if I remember correctly, um, recently did some uh, installations in the Holy Land. I can't remember if it was in Bethlehem or some other sacred site tied in to, 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 uh, to Jesus that is in, that's in the Holy Land, but there's a very large bas-relief that's part of those doors that of course shows the Polish Pope. Great. Um, why do you think that there was so much influence by Polish architects in Chicago? Was it because there was so many Polish immigrants here and that's kind of what they wanted to see? Or what do you think uh, caused so much influence? So, because I guess in a word I'd say because there were so many of them. Now, one of the unfortunate things is, you know, I, I do my best, Dominic and many others do their best to try to save these stories from falling into oblivion. But I'll give a great example. So um, there was a very noted architect, Foy Medeski, who did a number of uh, very noted buildings, both in the loop, uh, either under firms or under his own firm of Voy Medeski Architects. Um, he had a presentation that was at Chicago Public Library about given the fact that he was a Polish-American architect, about some of these beautiful, noted modern buildings where Polish-Americans that were part of the teams, uh, you know, it was a building, let's say, designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, but there was a pole that was a draftsman that worked on this building or that assisted in this way. And that information died with him. I, for years, had pestered him. I'm like, boy, can you find this for me? And he sent me a partial of one of his presentations. And... I don't remember if I was even able to open it. And unfortunately, that information passed with him. Uh, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, maybe some scholar in the future will research this topic. Um, aside from the, the Cumberland uh, station that is on the blue line, uh, the, the O'Hare branch of the CTA, which was designed by him, there's not a lot of information about buildings that were designed by 
Polish architects in the later part of the 20th century. Hopefully someone will help that change. That's great. Well, we just have a couple minutes left, so I'll ask kind of one final question that I know, uh, Daniel, your work at Forgotten Chicago, you're very passionate about. Um, Chicagoans love architecture, but we also know so many things we have failed to preserve and we've lost. What can Chicagoans do to help save these important buildings, landmarks, artworks, pieces of public art um, for future generations? Take action. When people <laughs> organize, these things are different. Let's remember, we're from Chicago. We are from the city where community organizing really began. And we Chicagoans, we know that when we get upset, you pick up a clipboard, you talk to your neighbors, you go to the local PTO, the, the Friday night fish fry, and you talk to your neighbors. And when people get riled up, people will pay attention. And so if we take action on these values, things will change accordingly, I believe. That's great. And also, folks, don't forget to check out ForgottenChicago.com that has so much great information about this and many other um, buildings that uh, have been forgotten. And you're going to learn so much about them. Um, we're at our time here, but I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and watching. This is a wonderful program. Thank you so much, Daniel. What a great way to celebrate Polish American <laughs> Heritage Month here. Um, coming up, we have many other programs that are related to the theme Beyond Borders uh, and the, the book Exit West by Mosin Hamid, which is our One Book, One Chicago selection. I want to mention just a couple of upcoming programs. Uh, tomorrow, Thursday, October 22nd, we're going to have a ancestry workshop, uh, Beyond Ancestry Newspaper Resources for Genealogy Research. So if you're interested in genealogy, perhaps you want to research your Polish heritage, definitely check that out. Uh, on Friday at noon, we're going to have the first edition of our new web TV series, Snacks in the Stacks, where we'll be cooking up recipes from books found on the shelves of Chicago Public Library. And then I uh, also want to encourage you to check out the Chicago Public Library YouTube channel for our series, Chicago Neighborhoods Beyond Borders. We're going to have 10 episodes. We've released three. We release a new episode every Wednesday at noon uh, that explore all of the wonderful neighborhoods of Chicago and how they have been influenced by immigrants and migrants uh, in the past and the present and in the future. So thanks so much for coming out, everybody. I hope you had an enjoyable time. This video will be available on demand. So if you have friends who missed it, just check the link in just a couple of minutes. It'll be up and uh, you can share it with them. Have a great night. Thanks, Dan.